Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. Hi, I'm Amy Felsch, and I'm a Master Gardener for Prince William County. I volunteer with the vegetable team at the Teaching Garden, which is located off of Linton Hall Road in Bristow, Virginia, on the grounds of the Benedict Monastery. We also teach a vegetable garden series during the winter months. This presentation is part of those classes. All right, so there's one thing I've learned from volunteering at the teaching garden, and that's if you plant a vegetable garden, they will come. And by they, I'm referring to insects, disease, and wildlife. These three issues can truly become an extremely frustrating part of gardening. So during this presentation, I'm going to be focusing on insects and disease and how to best go about managing these garden woes based on something called integrated pest management or IPM. So I'm sure we're all familiar with that traditional form of pest control, which involves that routine application of pesticides to eradicate a current situation. Well, IPM, it's the exact opposite. It's more of a process that combines different management techniques like cultural, physical, mechanical, biological, and sometimes chemicals. But you see, chemicals are always used as a last resort because the guiding principle behind IPM is to always select the least toxic, toxic methods first. So what does that mean? Well, it means that when we're faced with one of these garden issues, we are going to always start with the methods that have the least impact to our waterways, the air we breathe, the beneficial microorganisms, insects, and wildlife, and to the plants we grow, especially those that produce food for us. So think everything that affects our own health and the world around us. So to sum it up, there are no quick fixes. IPM focuses on long-term strategies. So with that understanding, let's dig right into the topic that probably creates the most uncomfortableness and has us wanting to reach for that quick fix chemical sprays, and that's bugs. But unfortunately, I found that bugs are just really misunderstood. So I wanna take a closer look at their world to see if we can't garner a new appreciation for these guys that are undoubtedly gonna be sharing our gardens with us. But here's the tricky part, guys. There's a lot of bugs out there. So I can't possibly speak about every bug that may cross your garden path. But what I can do is arm you with a series of questions that you can ask yourself and actions that you can take that are gonna help guide you to a better understanding of what you're dealing with and how to best go about managing it. And now our goal with insect management is that we want to encourage the good guys and minimize the bad bugs, okay? And notice I said um, minimize and not eradicate because we're going to do this all without the use of harmful insecticides. So before I get into what those questions are, we really need to have a good understanding of how bugs damage our gardens in the first place and they do this with their mouth parts. And they either have a chewing mouth part or a sucking mouth part that's similar to like a beak where it's gonna pierce the leaf and suck the nutrients out. So here's the thing. These guys are tiny, right? So in order to compete on their playing field, we need to become an observant gardener. That's our first action. And by that, I mean we need to become a detective because these guys, they're always leaving behind signs and symptoms. So what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for chewed leaves, discoloration, distortion, dieback, insect products, and of course the bugs themselves. Now, I really can't emphasize enough the importance of becoming that observant detective gardener, and here's why. Bugs are best controlled when their populations are low. So if you're just out in your garden, kind of meandering around, looking at everything from a distance, well, you might have just missed the opportunity to break up the beginning of a bad bug party that has the potential to become extremely destructive. All right, so when you're headed out to your garden, it's these questions that you wanna have in your back pocket. And go ahead and bring along that smartphone. It's such a great tool to be able to take pictures, um, document your findings, and conduct research. All right, so just 
As an example, let's say that you've planted potatoes in your garden, and because you're being that observant gardener, you notice some chewing damage. So upon closer inspection, you can see the bugs that are causing that damage. So you want to start by getting some good um, pictures of those bugs that you're seeing. Now that very first question that you want to ask needs to be, what bugs like potato plants? I've really found that by formulating your question in this manner, it's going to help that search engine greatly reduce its results to bugs that are specific to the plant you're dealing with. And one more thing. If we're going to take the time to do research, well, we want to make sure that we're going to be doing it on a reliable site. So your best bet for accurate information is going to come from sites that end in .edu or .gov. All right, so after comparing the bugs online um, to the pictures that you've taken and what you're seeing in your garden, you come to the conclusion that most likely you're dealing with the Colorado potato beetle. Um, so your very next question needs to be, what's the life cycle of the Colorado potato beetle? It's so important to not only be able to recognize the adult bugs, and I'll tell you the majority of the times that you type in that first question, um, that search engine is going to spit out results um, that show only pictures of the adult bugs. But you want to make sure that you're familiar with what the immature stage looks like as well as their eggs. This is really crucial because a lot of times the adult and the immature stage, they look nothing alike and yet they're both doing damage to your garden. So that the third question that you want to be asking is, what does the damage leave behind look like? This can be valuable information, especially if that suspect isn't around. And then finally, what's the least toxic method to deal with this situation? Now let's just say that after going through this process, you're feeling a little leery of your findings. Um, well, we have a great resource for you and that's the help desk at the Extension Office. It's manned by Master Gardener volunteers who are there to help you answer these questions. And the best part about this service is that it's free. So definitely take advantage of it and call or email us. All right, so let's put the previous slides into practice by reviewing the process the vegetable team has gone through, you know, as we've encountered different bugs out at the teaching garden. All right, so this is a bug that probably many of you are already familiar with. So sometimes we quote unquote luck out and we know um, exactly who we're dealing with. In this case, we're very familiar with these Japanese beetles on our ornamental plants and that lacy leaf damage that they leave behind. Well, one summer, these guys showed up in large numbers on the silks of our corn plant which was something we weren't used to seeing. So the research began, as mainly we just wanted to know why they were eating our corn plants. Well, it turns out that they've actually made a name for themselves in this department, and they're known as silk clippers. And their destructive damage interferes with the corn's ability to pollinate, which leads to incomplete ear fill and overall loss of yield. Now, upon further research, we learn that these are the very same fellows that sit beneath our soil and eat our grass roots. Many um, of us know this lawn issue as having grubs, but perhaps some have not made that connection between the Japanese beetle and the grubs being very much one and the same. Now, I don't have a picture of their eggs um, as they're extremely tiny and only found in the soil, so you're probably unlikely to observe them. So what did we do with all these Japanese beetles eating our corn plants? Well guys, I have a very high tech system that you too can have. It involves gathering some empty plastic jars, filling them with a bit of dish soap and water, and every bad bug, adult, immature, and egg stage gets put into this jar. Now we've named this jar the bad bug swimming pool and the joke around the garden is that there is never a lifeguard on duty. So this mechanical control of handpicking is an excellent example of using the least toxic method. And it is our go-to approach out at the garden as we never use pesticides. So um, that's master gardener, Harriet Carter in the upper right. And she grew our corn that year and very diligently made sure that every single one of those Japanese beetles took a permanent dunk in that swimming pool. And as you can see, that was a pretty busy day. All right, this is a true story behind this photo. 
It was an early spring evening and we were just about to finish up our workday and feeling a bit hungry when we remembered the asparagus might be ready for sampling. Um, and as you can see, we were pretty stoked about this. Well, that was a Thursday evening and we were back out at the garden on a Saturday morning and we thought, you know, we'll just start our workday with some asparagus. But when we got over there, we knew right away something was wrong. You see our asparagus plants, they looked a little bit spindly and some were bent over in like a shepherd's hook. So this was our sign that we needed to become that observant detective gardener and go in for a closer look. And boy, were we in for a surprise. Because not only did we see the adult bugs, but we saw the immature stages and the eggs. We had an entire life cycle hanging out on our asparagus plants. Now what's important to note here is that we'd grown asparagus for a number of years and had never had any issues. So this bug was new to us. So the first thing we did was take pictures and actually these first three photos are from that day. So now we were ready to ask that first question, what bugs like asparagus plants? And making sure to only conduct our research on those reliable sites, right, .edu or .gov, we learned that there are two bugs, the common asparagus beetle and the spotted asparagus beetle. But by zooming in on our photos that we had taken, we were able to identify that we were dealing with the common asparagus beetle. So now we had three of our four questions already answered. We knew what bug we were dealing with, and they were oh so kind to give us live visual samples of their life cycle, and we could see the chewing damage that they were leaving behind. So now we just needed to learn the least toxic method to handle the situation. And here's what we found out. These guys like to overwinter in leaf debris, and we'd actually had a lot of leaves that had collected around the base of our asparagus plants that had blown in from neighboring trees. So we made sure to bag up those leaves. We also learned that these guys can have two generations per year, so it's really important to disrupt that life cycle. So with gloved hands, we made sure that every adult, immature stage, and eggs were put into that bad bug swimming pool. So sanitation and that mechanical control of hand picking were our least toxic methods. But more importantly, we were now aware of the situation. So every time we were out at the garden, we were making sure to be extra observant and managing any more bugs that we found. Okay, so this is not actually a bug, but I had to include it because it's been plaguing our garden for the past couple of years and you know it's getting bad when slugs feel they can hitchhike to their next meal destination on your garden boot. So let's talk slugs. They're actually quite fascinating. For starters, they're hermaphroditic, meaning each slug you see has both a male and a female reproductive organ. Translation, every slug you see has the potential to lay hundreds of eggs, which is not so good for us gardeners. Now these guys can have a lifespan of one to five years, and it's not just their adult stage that can overwinter, but also their immature stage and their eggs. And if we have a mild winter followed by a wet spring, these guys can show up in droves with voracious appetites. Now they mostly feed at night and on overcast rainy days, and their feeding damage of large irregular holes can look a lot like other pest, pest damage. But it's that slime trail that's going to let us gardeners know who we're actually dealing with. Now they love to hang out in wet decaying matter, so ways we manage these guys is to only water our plants in the morning at the soil level so that way our garden beds have a chance to dry out during the day and we aren't creating that wet habitat that they love so much at night. We also make sure to clean up all the leaf litter that falls around the plants. Now I know many books and people in the industry swear by the beer traps. I do want to caution against the traditional slug baits as those are extremely poisonous to your children and pets and even the diatomaceous earth has the potential to become a lung irritant if accident accidentally inhaled. So you would never want to apply that stuff on a windy day and it also has to be reapplied every time it rains. So again, our go-to approach is to handpick these slugs and put them in the bad bug swimming pool and we always make sure to wear gloves when we do this. All right, so these are some fellows that can help keep that bad bug swimming pool um, slug population to a minimum. 
So this slide is a bit of a teaser as I'm going to be showcasing more bugs that are on our side a bit later. But these next few slides that I'm going to be showing you are of bad bugs that we consistently, without fail, see out at the garden year after year. So the benefit of this exposure is that the process gets easier, right? Instead of having to go through all the steps of identification, it becomes more of a lesson in review. So every year we plant squash, which means every year we invite this fellow. So here's the thing about being that observant detective gardener. Check these two images out in the lower right uh, or the lower left corner. We were able to catch the squash bug in the act of laying eggs and in the act of hatching. So talk about being able to mitigate a future issue early, right? These guys never even had a chance to start their damage. So another benefit of being exposed to the same bugs over and over again is that you start to recognize their behavior and in turn you learn tips and tricks on how to go about managing them. So when we first started working out in the garden, we were noticing the damage that these fellows were causing with their piercing sucking mouth part. At first there would be the stripling effect on the leaves and then eventually the leaves would turn yellow and die back. Now we were finding squash bugs, but not enough to warrant the damage that was happening out in the garden. So we consulted a wiser expert who told us to take the garden hose and water at the base of the plant and be observant. Guys, it was crazy. All these squash bugs we didn't see on our first bug check, they all came out of their hiding places and were scurrying up the plant. So the trick we learned is that we never mulch our squash plants and we're always cleaning up any leaf litter as we don't want to aid these guys' ability to hide. Okay, so check out this handsome guy. He is my um, one of my absolute favorites, mostly because he's just so artsy. I mean, even his eggs are outlined in black. But because they are so fancy, they're easy to spot and easy to remember. Now one thing to note about the eggs, they love to lay their eggs on the underside of leaves and actually a lot of bugs will do this. So make sure your detective work includes looking for egg masses on the underside of the leaves. Now this fellow, both the nymphs and the adults, will feast on your crucifers and brassicas like your cabbage, your broccoli, your cauliflower by piercing the leaves and sucking the nutrients out. So how do we manage these guys? Well, we use something called a row cover, which is just a lightweight permeable fabric, which helps keeps, keeps them out. So one year we planted way too much broccoli to be able to fit under the amount of row cover that we had. So a few broccoli plants were left just outside the row cover. So as you can imagine, those broccoli plants look like a lit up Christmas tree with all these colorful harlequin bugs all over them but it made our job of knocking them off into the bad bug swimming pool very easy. So what those broccoli plants became known as is something called a trap crop. Now a trap crop are plants that are grown um, to specifically lure an offending pest away from your nearby crops. But what's important to note is that once the trap crop has served its purpose, it must be removed from the garden as it's going to continue to draw that offending pest, but once those pests realize there's no more foliage for it to feast on, they're gonna quickly go seek your healthy plants. Um, and another thing to note is that you never wanna put trap crops into your compost pile as bugs can be vectors of disease. So you don't wanna introduce that to your compost pile. All right, the imported cabbage worm. This is another pest of the cabbage family. You know, we would go out to the garden in the morning and we, um, would see this right where this you know red arrow is pointing all over our cabbage plants leaves and this my friends is cabbage worm poo or frass for a better term it's an example of an insect product and it is our sign that we need to get down on our hands and knees and start looking for worms now at first these worms start out really small which means their chewing mouth part is only leaving tiny holes in the leaves but as that mouth part continues to grow, so do the holes in your leaves. And if left unchecked, you could have nothing but the midrib of your plant left. So the trick we learned is at the end of the workday, we make sure to take the garden hose and wash off all the frass. 
That way, when we come out to the garden again, if we see more frass, well, we know we have more worms we need to be looking for. Now, the butterfly is not doing damage to your garden. She is happily flying around and pollinating your plants. But she's also doing something else. She is laying eggs, eggs you can't see. So again, we use that row cover as a means to keep her out. Now I'm also showing some images of the black army cutworm as this is another fellow that has been plaguing our garden. Um, but the same management techniques I just talked about apply to this guy as well. So here's that Colorado potato beetle I used as an example from earlier. Now we love um, to grow potatoes out at the teaching garden and I grow them in my raised beds at home. So talk about a lesson in review. I've gotten to know these guys way better than I want to. So notice the image of the larvae um, and how it really look, looks nothing like the adult stage. So this is an excellent example of why it's so important to learn the life cycle of the bug you're dealing with because both stages will be doing damage to your garden with their chewing mouth parts. Um, so these guys will overwinter in the garden soil um, and they can start their damage as soon as those potato shoots emerge. So one way we manage these fellows um, is by strawing our potato plants. Now we straw, um, we lay straw around our potato plants for many reasons, but the straw will slow those beetles down as they're emerging from the soil. And it's also doing something else. It's providing a great habitat for our predatory friends, the spiders. So those spiders move right in on those beetles, which means less for us to deal with. So definitely a win-win. All right, this is my least favorite bug, okay? We've had these guys out in swarms on our pumpkin plants. They can overwinter in nearby woods and weeds, and they can have two to three generations per year. They love to hang deep down in the blossoms, and we found that the only thing you accomplish if you dig, um, go in and dig after them is that you just end up tearing up the blossom. So a trick we've learned is that you can take the garden hose, fill the blossom up with water, they'll float to the top, and you can get them into the bad bug swimming pool. Now what makes these guys so bad is that they're serious vectors of disease, so much so that you could come out to your garden in the morning and find wilt and sudden death to your plant. They're just a bad bug. But check this image out. This was another great sighting out at the teaching garden. Do you remember that bad bug swimming pool filled with all those Japanese beetles? Well, this assassin bug must be Harriet's BFF, right? And I think it's an ex excellent example of why it's so important to select the least toxic methods because pesticides don't discriminate. They will kill your bad bugs right along with your good bugs. And your good bugs are another way to help control those bad bugs. So it's just as important to do your research and understand what bugs should be left alone in the garden. So let's talk about some bugs that we would gladly leave the garden gate open for. So there's three types of beneficial insects, the predator, the parasitoids, and the pollinators. So the picture to your left was also taken out at the teaching garden. And I just have to say, when you truly become that observant detective gardener, be prepared to be amazed. That's what happened on this particular day. We were doing our routine bug check when we came across these eggs that were hanging off our shallot plants. Now they look like they were suspended in midair and glowing. Now this was a new find to us and thank goodness we did our research because these are the eggs of the green lacewing and something we learned we very much wanted hanging out in our garden. Now the reason why these eggs are hanging from these fine filaments with just enough elbow room between each other is because when they hatch, they are such ferocious eaters that they will actually eat each other. But what are they really looking for? Well, they're looking for aphids and they've done such a great job of eating aphids that they've been nicknamed the aphid lion. So perhaps you've seen the adult flying around your outside lights. Well, if you do, just smile and hope she's laying eggs in your garden too. Now, something else happened on this day too. You see, this find caused so much excitement um, that the gardeners from the ornamental beds that don't always venture over into the vegetable garden, they were coming over to take a look and we were sharing what we had learned. 
So I encourage you, when you find something so exciting out in your garden, you know, don't keep it to yourself. Share it with your neighbor, your spouse, your kids, because it's this sharing of information which can help remove a lot of that uncomfortableness that people feel about bugs. So this is another predatory insect that perhaps many of you are familiar with. Well, up until recently, I wasn't familiar with what the egg case looked like. I had one of these egg cases attached to the underside of my patio umbrella, and I honestly thought it was some type of you know, wasp nest, so talk about feeling uncomfortable. Well, around that same time, there happened to be an egg case attached to the row cover out at the teaching garden. And Thomas Boyles, our extension agent, enlightened me to what it actually was. So again, it was the sharing of information that helped to remove the uncomfortableness I was feeling. So be on the lookout for these egg cases. They are usually attached to like woody stems. They can be found in leaf litter, fence posts, row covers. But the female will lay her egg case in the fall and it's going to overwinter with lots of brothers and sisters. And then the warm temperatures of spring will tell them it's time to emerge. So someone also brought in an egg case to Thomas's office and the warm temperatures of the office confused these guys into thinking it was time to join the world. So it's definitely not a good idea to bring an egg case into your home. But as you can see, these guys um, are just, you know, smaller versions of their adult self. Now, I understand there's been a lot of controversy about the Chinese mantid outcompeting our native mantid. What's important to understand is that a lot of our predators are what's called generalist. They will eat your bad bugs, but sometimes those good bugs will get in their clutches too. So you know that saying the bad and the good are always intertwined? Well, that is definitely the case in the insect world. So let me introduce the brachnid wasp and the hornworm. Now I am convinced the creator of all those alien movies got their ideas from these two. So let me explain. The hornworm is the villain. He will chomp away at your tomato plants and he'll leave these grenade looking frass all over your leaves. But should he go into the bad bug swimming pool? Because you see, he attracts the brachnid wasp who is very much beneficial. And this is where the story gets interesting. So that brachnid wasp will fly into your garden and she will seek out a hornworm. And when she finds one, she will lay her eggs inside the hornworm. Those eggs will hatch and the larvae will eat the hornworm from within. So as you can see, that hornworm is no longer an issue to your tomato plants. Once that larvae has had its fill, it will chew a hole and emerge on the outside of the hornworm, where it will then spin its cocoon, pupate inside, and then emerge as an adult and then the whole cycle begins again. So guys, what this demonstrates is that the good and the bad of the insect world is not black and white. It's more of a balancing act, and we as gardeners have to ask ourselves, how much damage is acceptable? If you only have a little bit of damage happening to your tomato plants, then maybe it's best to leave those hornworms alone, because that brachnid wasp is only going to come to your garden if she has a food source and a habitat for her young. Now, if you have a ton of damage happening to your tomato plants, then maybe the bad bug swimming pool is the way to go. And I can't emphasize enough just how delicate that balance is between the bad and the good bugs. There are so many instances where the bad and the good have become one. For example, there's the female tiffia wasp who will go underground and she will seek out grubs. And for each grub she finds, she will attach one of her eggs. And the tachnid fly attaches her eggs to those Japanese beetles. These are instances that we can't see with our naked eye. So we may believe that we are target targeting a specific pest, when in reality, we've just taken out an entire new population of good bugs that could have been on our side helping us out. And finally, what's a garden without flowers? Well, to the vegetable garden, it's so important to intermix flowers amongst your vegetable plants. Our vegetable plants, they depend on those pollinators in order to fruit. We would not have things like squash, melons, or cucumbers without our pollinators. 
So perhaps your plants look like they're growing well and then all of a sudden the blossom falls off. Or maybe your plants start to fruit but then become misshapen or die back completely. This could be because of poor pollination. So make sure to include high floral diversity, especially native plants, intermixed amongst your vegetable plants to encourage those visiting pollinators. Now, all this information can most certainly be overwhelming, but remember there's a lot of great resources online that can help you. For example, these are two downloadable posters that display both the good bugs and the bad bugs that are common to the plants we grow. Um, and you could print this off and keep it in your garden supplies. And remember that that help desk at the extension office is always there to guide you too. So remember, being an observant gardener is your best deterrent. Walk the garden every day looking for signs and symptoms of bugs. And when you find a bug, ask those questions that will help guide you to a better understanding of what you're dealing with and how to best go about managing it. And always take the time to research the life cycle of the bug you're dealing with. So do you know who this guy is? They are the larvae stage of our ladybugs, which do an excellent job of eating um, aphids. And it's another great example of why it's so important to know the different growth stage stages of the bug that you're dealing with. It's also important to understand that things won't be perfect. When we garden organically, there will be damage. Whether we realize it or not, we've become so conditioned by that produce section in the grocery store to expect that all our fruits and vegetables are going to have this nice unblemished skin. But how many times have we taken home that perfect fruit or vegetable only to find that it was mealy and lacked any taste? And taste is one of the reasons why we grow our own food. And yet so much of what we harvest doesn't look like what's being sold in the grocery store. For example, this tomato would never pass for being sold in the grocery store, and probably not the farmer's market either. We have this conversation a lot out at the teaching garden, as everything we grow, we provide to the on-site monastery, and our conversations center around what vegetables are worthy to bring over, even though we know it will all taste delicious. So what we really need to do is change our mindset on the definition of perfect, because when I sliced away those not so perfect parts of this tomato, there is still plenty of juicy tomato left to enjoy. It's also important to take things in stride because you know, sometimes those bugs are just gonna win. So this picture was taken right before we were getting ready to remove this cucumber plant. And you can see that's Thomas in the background. He's not looking very happy, but he's taking things in stride. So two things occurred that caused the early demise of this cucumber plant. First, that dreaded cucumber beetle got out from under us. And if you remember me saying, the reason why those guys are so bad is because they're serious vectors of disease. So you guessed it, those little boogers passed along the bacteria wilt virus. So what this demonstrates is that often, if not most times, you will be dealing with more than one issue when it comes to an unhealthy plant. So you want to make sure that your detective work includes not only looking for signs and symptoms of bugs, and this segues right into our next topic, but also disease. Okay, so disease is a challenging subject. And unlike with bugs, which we clearly saw have their benefits, even the bad bugs have their benefits, I find no redeeming qualities when it comes to disease. It's absolutely maddening, whether it's happening to ourselves, our loved ones, or to our plants, it's extremely frustrating. And oftentimes, we're left with no answers. And that's because disease is difficult to diagnose. Understand that unless a person's title includes plant pathologists, there are no real experts. So our best strategy is going to involve being that observant detective gardener, asking the right questions and documenting our findings so that we can arrive at a good educated guess or we can provide accurate, helpful information to those trained individuals who can take our plant samples and our information and give us a more conclusive diagnosis. 
So here's where I'm going to confess that I have sat in a lot of lectures that focus on disease. And most of the lectures involve flashing images of unhealthy plants and discussing the diseases that afflicted them. So these lectures were fascinating and I thoroughly enjoyed them. But the problem was when I went out to my own garden and started seeing issues, those images really didn't help. I didn't have an action plan to go about figuring out what was happening in my garden. So that's what I would like to focus on here, arming ourselves with an action plan. So to do that, we must first understand what disease is. And I want to start with the definition because it's actually in the defi definition that tells us gardeners what our first action needs to be. So the definition is that disease is an impairment of the normal state of living that interrupts, modifies, or stresses vital functions. It's this part of the definition, a normal state of living, that tells us gardeners what our first action needs to be. And that is we must first have a good understanding of what a healthy plant looks like. In other words, we have to have a good understanding of what is normal for the plants we are growing so that we're able to detect early the beginnings of an issue. So for example, it's familiar that tomato leaves are green. Well, there are some tomato varieties where the leaves are purple. If we didn't understand that was the normal growth pattern for that variety, we might think something is wrong and start doing things to that tomato plant that we really shouldn't be doing. So take the time to increase your plant-based knowledge to learn what the normal growth pattern is for the plants you're growing versus when there's actually an issue. It's also important to understand the components that come together that cause disease in the first place. So specific conditions must be present for the disease to develop. And it's like a kaleidoscope that all bears down on that first component, which is the host. In this case, that's your vegetable garden. The next component is an environment that's conducive to the development of disease. Now, weather plays a huge role here. Think temperature extremes, moisture extremes, but it also includes other factors like poor soil health, too much pesticides. But what's important to understand about this component is that it's non-living and non-spreading. A lot of times it'll be referred to as an environmental disease or disorder. But what this factor is doing is it's weakening your plant and making them more susceptible to the next component, which is the pathogen. And that is your living spreading disease. And then the final component is time. So when the host, favorable environment and the pathogen all coincide for a period of time, well, you've just built yourself a sturdy table for disease. So unlike with bugs, where most of the time you can actually lay eyes on the suspect, there are very few instances when it comes to disease that you're actually viewing the disease organism. What you're actually seeing are the signs and symptoms that organism is causing, and it's the observant gardener that will then be able to tell their plant is no longer in a normal state of living. Now, if one leg of that table is removed, disease caused by the pathogen cannot occur. But before we get too excited, let's take a closer look at exactly what that means. So if we remove the host, we don't have a vegetable garden, which is why you're taking the time to listen to this presentation. So that's definitely not an option. And we have absolutely no control over time. So that leaves the environmental component. And I'll be the first to admit a lot is still out of our control when it comes to mother nature. And yet so much is in our control within this component. And it's our job to provide the best growing conditions so that our plants can grow to be their strongest and healthiest to stand up to those factors that we can't control. And this is where prevention becomes our biggest defense against disease. And the reason we want to take preventative measures is because disease is best controlled if it's never allowed to take hold in the first place. This all starts by being that observant detective gardener choosing the right location. We like to say right plant, right place. 
You do not want to grow your vegetable garden in the shade. It will only lead to weak and spindly plants. Aim for an area that is well draining and receives six to eight hours of sun. Grow and care for your soil first. This is so important. You want to let biology do its work. I really want you to think of compost and cover crops as your biggest teammates out in the garden with you because it's those two that will help increase that microbial population and diversity, which is then going to compete against those pathogens. You know, I took a class um, where a plant pathologist stated that probably our most effective disease management tool is choosing resistant or tolerant varieties. So there's always that option too. There are so many good cultural practices to follow, like taking the time to conduct a soil test as nutrient stress reduces plant disease tolerance. Inspect your plants for bugs and disease before you buy and plant, okay? Because it'd be a real bummer to introduce an issue right from the get-go, right? Always water at the soil level, no overhead watering. Stake and trellis your plants to keep them off the ground and provide mulch barriers between your plants and the soil as excess soil on the limbs and leaves can enhance disease. And you never want to work in a wet garden because bacteria and fungi, they live and multiply in free water. And you want to practice sanitation, which means cleaning up your garden debris such as leaf litter, and you want to disinfect your garden tools and not just your garden tools, but also think about your gloves and your garden boots. And then finally, you want to rotate your crops. You don't want to be planting the same plant families in the same location year after year. So these are just some of the preventative measures you can take, but collectively, these actions are termed best practices. And it's these practices, when used in combination with one another, that provides the best odds when it comes to defending against disease. And remember, just like with our own health, preventing disease is a lot easier than curing it. But what do we do when disease does find its way in the garden? Well, we slap that detective hat on, grab our phones, and interrogate our gardens with a series of questions, making sure to document our findings. So folks, this is our action plan. Remember to take the time to increase your plant-based knowledge. Make sure to know what the normal growth pattern is for the plants you're growing. Research the diseases that are common to the plants you are growing and familiarize yourself with what those diseases look like so you can get a jump start on any potential issues. These next actions are really important, okay? Be on the lookout for signs of spread and pattern. Disease caused by the pathogen, it's dynamic. It will change over time. So if you walk out to your garden and you see the same issue and it's only happening to say your tomatoes and not to any of the other plant families in your garden and this issue is slowly changing or spreading around the plant, that's a good indication that you're dealing with that pathogen component. Now, if you walk out to your garden and you see the same type of damage across all your different plant families, and that issue is not changing over time, well then that's a good indication that you're dealing with that environmental component. A great example is when you wake up in the morning and there's been frost, okay? Um, you're going to see that same type of damage. It's going to be affected all your different plant families and it's not going to change over time. Okay, you want to learn the environmental factors that tend to favor the diseases that can plague your plants and compare these to what's going on in your microclimate. Is there more than one factor going on? Be on the lookout for signs and symptoms of bugs, um, the environmental component and the pathogen component. It really can be a trifecta where all three are occurring. And finally, what is the least toxic method to handle the situation? Here's where I'm going to tell you that our go-to approach out at the teaching garden is to remove and dispose. And the reason we can do this is because most vegetable plants have a very short life cycle. Um, and disease usually coincides with that life cycle nearing the end of its production phase. So it's just not worth it to us to keep a plant in the garden that could be affecting our soil for years to come. So we bag it up and we remove it from the garden. We never put disease material in the compost pile. Even if we are unsure it's a, if it's diseased, we'll err on the side of caution and bag it up. 
Most of the time, we're also not taking that extra step to identify exactly what disease we're dealing with. We are usually just managing the situation and only going to that next level of identification if it's something that's continually plag plaguing our garden. All right, so let's practice that action plan by going through a scenario that the vegetable team has gone through many times. Um, and of course, it deals with tomatoes, um, the divas of the garden. So at the teaching garden, we're very fortunate to have master gardeners who grow our tomatoes from seed and bring us these beautiful tomato starts. But no matter where you get your plants from, make sure to inspect them for signs of disease and bugs. Because again, it'd be a real bummer to introduce that um, issue right from the start in your garden. So we make sure to plant and care for these plants and they are growing beautifully until one day um, due, to be, due to our observant gardening skills, we notice these spots on the lower leaves of our tomato plants. Right away, we know this is not the normal grow, growth pattern um, for the tomato plants. So we get our cameras out and we start taking pictures of what we're seeing. And the photos in the slide are from that day. So now we're ready to start our detective work. The first thing we do is to look for signs and symptoms of bugs, which we didn't find any. Then we look to see if this issue was happening to any of our other plant families in the garden. And we conclude that no, this issue is specific to our tomato plants. And finally, is this issue changing over time? And we determine that yes, this issue seems to be slowly moving around and up our tomato plants um, as these spots were kind of appearing higher on some of our other tomato plants. So, from these observations, we're like, oh no, this is, we're probably dealing with that pathogen component. The next thing we do is really take a look at what we are seeing by zooming in on the pictures that we've taken and we notice that these aren't just spots on our tomato plants, okay? These spots have concentric rings. Now, this is the type of detailed detective work I want you to be doing because as you will see, this detailed information will be key in helping us determine what we have going on. So now it's time to consult Professor Google by asking that question, what diseases are common to tomato plants? Remember to make sure to stick to reliable sites like .edu or .gov when doing your research. And when you do, and when you ask that question, holy smokes, you will scroll through a ton of diseases that it can affect your tomato plants. But it's those concentric rings that helped us to narrow our search down and give us a good educated guess that most likely we are dealing with something called early blight. So upon further research, we learned the environmental conditions that favor early blight are warm temperatures, abundant rainfall, and high relative humidity. We compare that to what's been going on over the past couple of weeks in our microclimate out at the teaching garden, and sure enough, the conditions have been similar. We also learn that this disease can spread by wind and water splash and can survive the winter in plant debris. So now we are armed with a lot of information and we're ready to take action. This is a case where we're not going to remove and dispose of the plants because it's just too early in the season, so we're going to choose to manage the situation. The first thing we do is prune out any of the affected area, as well as the lower leaves on the plant um, that are near the soil level. We also clean up all the leaf litter surrounding the plants and we continue to do this throughout the season. This plant material gets bagged up and it's remember it's never placed in our compost pile. Next thing we do is we lay straw all around the base of the plant so that way um, when we water or when it rains the soil doesn't have a chance to splash back up on the leaves. We also make sure to only water at the soil, soil level. Remember, no overhead watering because you want to be minimizing leaf wetness. We make sure to sanitize our pruners, but not just our pruners, also our gloves and our garden shoes so that we're not accidentally spreading this disease around our garden. And then we just remain observant and vigilant throughout the garden season and we found that this disease although it can make our tomato plants look unsightly it really doesn't affect our production which is a good thing and then finally at the end of the season we make sure to bag up all the tomato plants we actually never put tomato plants in our compost pile just because they can harbor so many different diseases and then next season 
we will not be planting tomatoes in the same spot. We will be rotating our crops. All right, so there, again, are a lot of great resources online that can help you. This is a great one um, from Virginia Tech that, again, you could print off and keep with your garden supplies. And don't forget about that help desk. Take advantage of the microscopes, research materials, and master gardeners that man the help desk by dropping off a sample. Here's what you need to know to be successful. Remember, all master gardeners are volunteers, so make sure to call the office ahead of time to ensure that someone will be available to help. And they will also help guide you with the new procedures that are in place due to COVID. So you wanna obtain, obtain a fresh sample in the morning by collecting a good part of the plant that shows the margin between the affected area and the healthy area. In other words, you don't wanna just you know, take a diseased leaf. We're gonna to need to have a little bit more to go on. So you wanna place your sample in a clean paper bag left open and bring it to the office as soon as possible as being exposed to different temperature extremes in your car is not ideal. And if you can bring that sample to the office early in, earlier in the week, that's even better. Because if it's not something we're familiar with, then we will package it up and send it off to Virginia Tech. And we don't want your plant sample sitting in the pathologist's office over the weekend. So just think, the fresher the better. And finally, make sure to include all that great detective work you've been doing, as oftentimes the answers are in the details. So the more information, the better. And just to reiterate, make sure to call the office first to learn the current procedures in place due to COVID. So key takeaways when it comes to disease, take the time to increase your plant-based knowledge. Know the normal growth patterns for the plants you are growing. Practice prevention, which means no lazy gardening. Look for signs of spread and pattern and understand the difference between that environmental disorder and that pathogen component. Always be looking for more than one issue and understand that all three, bugs, environmental disorder, and the pathogen can be contributing to your plant problem. And remember, and I'm sure you're tired of me saying it, but none of this is possible without being that observant detective gardener. So just to circle back to the integrated pest management, it's so important to understand that this process takes time and change doesn't happen overnight. It's by using best practices and always, always selecting the least toxic methods season after season that our gardens can heal and create an environment that allows our plants to grow to be their strongest and healthiest and supply us with that abundant harvest that we're all after. If you enjoyed this video, please let us know. Give us your questions, your comments, and suggestions for other classes and videos. For more information on lawns and gardens, please contact the Extension Hort Help Desk at mastergardener at pwcgov.org. Thanks for watching. Have a good day.